Is there anything more surprising than seeing a protest in China in 2022? Well, so there were two big banners hung over a busy overpass in Beijing. In the videos, you can also see smoke coming from the bridge. We don't know what the source of smoke is, and one of the banners reads this: "Christine, quote, go on strike, remove dictator and national traitor Xi Jinping." There was also a loudspeaker with an unidentified voice reading the banners. <laughs> This was not just anywhere in China; it happened in Beijing, the capital. Not just any place in Beijing; it was the busiest part of town. Right in the middle of China's version of the Silicon Valley, and only a 15-minute drive away from where the Chinese government is located, and not just any time in Beijing, it was just a few days before the Chinese Communist Party's most important meeting of the decade. Which means that the security and surveillance systems were definitely maxed out. So the kind of shock value we are talking about here was basically on the same scale as seeing a dead body hanging on that statue at Columbus Circle the day before Macy's Thanksgiving parade. Well, I hope I'm not giving those Van Gogh vandalizers any new ideas here. Also, don't forget that it's mainland China we are talking about—a country where almost no protests ever happen. What this guy did was so rare that he was crowned the new tankman by the Washington Post because he was the first to ever put political slogans in the streets of Beijing since Tiananmen Square 30 years ago. Granted. After COVID, there have been more and more social discontent and unrest that led to some kind of demonstrations. But most Chinese protests involved a lot more kneeling and crying than more protesty things. Most demonstrators, many of whom lost their life savings to corrupt cadres, only asked for their specific grievances to be heard and did not call for any systemic reforms, let alone regime change. This was because they were still stuck in the "some bad apples" mindset. And believe that the party and the government are inherently legitimate and capable of good governance. To them, Beijing always had the people's best interests in mind. But some corrupt or incompetent local official screwed it all up, and the accountability has to stop there. Kneeling for hours on end was a display of total and absolute obedience, or their way of saying that they have no intention to challenge the powers that be. It is a medieval. Almost like a trial by ordeal way of proving one's innocence. It is also what kids in China would do back in the good old Confucian days when they felt that their parents had wronged them somehow. See the kind of paternalism in here? You cannot, under any circumstances, challenge the central father figure. This is nothing modern and has a long historical precedence. Most rebellions and uprisings in Chinese history were not explicitly issued against the emperor himself. But the bad company in his court that undermined his righteousness and lost him the mandate of heaven. The CCP is, of course, well aware of this, and sometimes they even tolerate such protests because they maintain the facade of freedom without posing an actual threat. This is also why, whenever something major goes wrong, they blame it on the local officials. Consequently, the local officials tend to double down on what they are told to do. And implement extra draconian policies to make sure that they will not be held accountable by the party in any shape or form. Them overdoing it was the root cause of most tragedies during China's COVID zeroing policy. This protester, on the other hand, did something fundamentally different. Instead of expressing a specific grievance against the local government, he aimed straight for the top, as he directly challenged Xi and went after his most important desire. Which is to break the term limits and stay in power forever, and his most important policy, which is zero COVID. I wouldn't say that he went the full nine yards, but definitely far enough considering the circumstances. The last time someone did something near this level was in 2018, when the girl randomly splashed ink on a picture of Xi in Shanghai and ended up being sent to a psych ward. 嗯嗯、This British guy was a lot better prepared and thus able to convey an arguably more powerful message by maximizing the very limited time frame he had. He not only refused to play within the government's rules and boundaries, 
but actively sought to undermine them and their effectiveness. To beat the neurotically detailed surveillance in Beijing, he made an elaborate plan to dress up as a construction worker to avoid suspicion and use rush hour traffic to slow down the police and buy more time for his banners and speakers. He was burning stuff to attract as much attention as possible, and also to leave the impression of self-immolation, which was not an uncommon way to express dissent in China. The Falun Gong did it, and so did the Tibetans. In other words, the British protester made the most out of his 15-minute free trial of freedom of speech that every Chinese person gets to enjoy only once every lifetime. His strategy was so successful that he was even able to upload a short clip to his Twitter before being arrested. Though the cyber cops quickly wiped out his entire online footprint, this is proof that the censorship machine is not an impregnable fortress. It is now bulletproof and consists of humans who can't get stuck in traffic. It can be breached, even if just for a few minutes, and with careful planning and solid execution, these loopholes could be further exploited. Hearing about this made me feel pretty emotional, because when I was a kid, I used to pass by this bridge almost every day on my way to school. There was often a large jobless community gathered around here, looking for odd jobs in tech, construction, or tutoring. Jobless, not homeless, because being homeless is more or less illegal in Beijing. I'm wondering if that is why the Bridgeman picked this spot specifically, and if he too had spent some of his 20s and 30s struggling to survive around here. But it wasn't just my personal memories that made me emotional. He did something that truly spoke to a lot of people. Chinese Twitter celebrated him as the single spark that can ignite the whole parry, optimistic that his martyrdom will make the whole country wake up from decades of apathy and moral slumber. Many Chinese students overseas paid homage to his bravery by putting up similar posters in public dashboards on their campuses. Even within the Great Firewall, there have been quite a few occasions where people risked their lives to echo his actions. We are seeing this kind of response because he really picked the perfect moment for activism. There is a lot, to say the very least, at stake for China with what's happening this week. Remember what I said earlier about how the CCP is having their most important meeting of the decade? Well, it is not just the most important meeting for the decade, it's probably the most important one since the 80s. Basically, each leader, who is both the head of the state as the president and head of the party as the general secretary, the latter being where the actual power comes from, is supposed to serve for two five-year terms. A national congress is held at the end of each term, and a successor is usually appointed at the congress after the first term. Polymatter has a good video on this, if you want to know more about how the party's transition of power works. At the last congress five years ago, Xi broke the party's internal rules by not appointing a successor, which means that he wants to stay in power for a third term. A year later, he consolidated his position by taking the presidential term limit out of the constitution, which, funny enough, was originally put in there by his dad, an outspoken liberal. This gives a whole new meaning to what Harold Bloom meant by the anxiety of influence. In any case, it is now 2022, and this current National Congress marks the end of Xi's second term, when he is supposed to step down. As you might have heard in the news a few hours ago, all went according to Xi's plan. He became the first since Mao to serve as the party chief for more than two terms, staffed the Politburo with his minions, and very unceremoniously removed his rival and predecessor Hu Jintao from the Congress. So much so that foreign policy even suspected that it might be a purge. This marks the final collapse of Deng's semi-neoliberal political legacy, and completes China's transition from, in Max Weber's language, a legal rational oligarchy into a charisma-based dictatorship, 
which is kind of funny given that C has next to no charisma himself. So this is the gravity of what's at stake. The Chinese word for a traitor that the Bridgman used in his banner in quote depose the despotic traitor C literally means thief of the nation, a term that originally described the Bonapartist warlord Yuan Shikai, who stole the revolution by snatching control over the Republic of China and declaring himself emperor. Further echoing this threat, the Bridgman's manifesto called for PLA soldiers to rise up against tyranny and be as brave as Cai E, Li Liejun and Tang Jiyao, all of whom were revolutionary generals who led uprisings against Yuan. He's also aiming his message at party congress delegates traveling into Beijing who might be living nearby, since there are a lot of provincial delegation offices around Sitong Bridge, in the hope that they might vote Xi out or something, as unlikely as that might be. As expected, none of this worked and Xi emerged stronger than ever. But I think, on some level, the British man was deeply aware of this futility. After all, it is one man versus one of the world's most entrenched systems of power. What made him all the more respectable is that despite knowing this, he still went ahead and did it anyway. There is a kind of Sisyphean honor in grappling with the absurd in this way, to do something without expecting the world to give it meaning in return, which in and of itself makes the endeavor meaningful. As Camus puts it, the absurd man contemplating his torment silences all the idols. Well, maybe even the idols in Beijing, if there are more absurd men like the one on the bridge. If you are on another level of pessimism, you might say that he is committing what Camus called the philosophical suicide, but I wouldn't go that far. What he has done has been more than sufficient for him to be celebrated as a hero. Okay, that's about all the facts of what happened or at least all that I can gather at the moment. I hope you can see by this point that this really isn't your weekly world politics digest, and there is a reason that I stepped out of my content niche to tell you about this. Unless you closely follow international news, chances are you're just hearing about this for the first time. When I was doing research for this video, there is absolutely no one talking about this on YouTube, except for the disinformation infested den known as Chinese YouTube. There should definitely be more coverage of the British man outside of Chinese language media. He testifies to a kind of moral courage that the Chinese people are capable of, and that message alone needs to be shown to a larger audience. That being said, as courageous and honorable as the British man was, I don't agree with Chinese Twitter's overwhelming optimism on what his martyrdom will bring about, and I will explain my rationale in the next video. The one sentence version is that people who are too optimistic are either reading too much into this or operating under a fundamentally outdated understanding of how Chinese propaganda works. Stay tuned for part 2. This is a brand new channel, so please bring my video to a larger audience with a simple like and subscribe. Thank you and see you next time.